John Ingrid, welcome to the show. Thank, well, thank you. you. We're excited to be here. Hey, I'm excited to have you as well. It's it's a it's pretty neat having a couple downsizing experts that we get to have this conversation with because this is something. I, my mom, she saw your book in the office a few days ago, and she texted me a picture of the the, the cover of the book. She said, "Hey, uh, can I take this home with me?" So she's interested in reading about this. I just got done talking to a lot of the advisors on our team prior to engaging in the conversation we're about to have, and and uh, two of them had already had clients today that had asked them questions about downsizing. So this is something that's coming up on almost a daily basis in our conversations with families when it comes to retirement planning. So I think it's a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed your book. I want to spend some time talking about some of your personal experiences. And I know you just have a great depth and breadth of knowledge to share with us. And I can't wait to dive in. Well, we're, okay. we're, we're looking forward to that. Well, this is something that we're very passionate about, so we're excited that we have an opportunity to share that with you. Awesome. Well, I, I wanted to start with just kind of creating a definition of downsizing because I think um, we all have a different idea of what it means to downsize, and I know you two have a unique way of looking at downsizing. I think you refer to that as right-sizing, I saw in your book. So can you just tell us how you define downsizing? Well, I'd, I'd like to take the right-sizing part of it because we actually kind of combine both words. But um, for me, the way that I like to describe that when we're doing a seminar is when when you first find your first home, you're, let's say, for example, you're moving into your first apartment or your first home, you're looking for something that's just the right size for you. And then as time goes on uh, and uh, possibly you get married, you want to find something that's going to be a, something big or just the right size for you and your spouse. Mm. And then the family comes along. And of course, now we have children, one or two, and we need something a little bit bigger that's going to be the right size. And we could continue on from there. But sooner or later, what happens is we end up becoming empty nesters. And now what's been the right size all along is too big. So a lot of our clients, when they become 55 and older, are looking for something more manageable, lock and leave type style that's going to be the right size for them. And often it's a two bedroom, two bath versus 3000 square feet, four bedrooms, two and a half with a large yard. Yeah. Yeah. Times tend to change uh, as we uh, get the kids out of the house. Right now we have two. We're uh, working on number three. We'll probably end up with four, five, six. No, I, I hope my wife doesn't listen to this. Now she'll no. think we're having six kids. No, I, <laughs> but we need right more space. <laughs> yeah, and right now it's, it's the right size. We've got space that we can have three. Now, if we go to four, it, it may not be the right size anymore. So I really like that. It makes sense because uh, I think sometimes we kind of, we can have a misconception of downsizing. It kind of sounds like a negative thing if we say, well, we're uh, downsizing. Yeah, the terms are pretty synonymous. They, they have the same end results, but sometimes we like to say you, if you downsize, you can have a bigger life or you're right sizing, you downsize to right size, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's all about that part in your life. But maybe it's um, moving to a place that's safer, that's more accommodating to you as you age, that has wider doorways and easier to get in and out of showers and those type of things too are important as you to consider to, uh, what it's going to be uh, to age in a healthy fashion. Casey, oftentimes when we are discussing this with a client, and I mean, you can literally see a light bulb come on when you talk about how old is your roof? Uh, when's the last time that you replaced your hot water heater? That's when people usually say, yeah, we really want to, don't want to deal with that anymore. Or we got to find a new landscaper this year. Um, we've really been thinking about downsizing. That sounds more appealing to us. Yeah. And that period of time is about eliminating stress, I think, right? That's I mean, right. we're focusing on a period of time we can just enjoy life, do the things we want to do, when we want to do them, how we want to do them, and reduce some of the clutter, some of the complexities that a larger home might bring to the table. And I love in your book, you, you mentioned that downsizing can lead to a longer, happier, healthier life. Well, Absolutely. isn't that what we all seven want? Seven years, seven years longer. I share that statistic with me again. 
Seven years. Well, they, yeah, they. one of the statistics they use about looking to downsize and finding the right place to live, and a lot of times that is a senior living community where you can socially engage with people and have exercise programs where you just walk down the hall mm -hmm. or, you know, across the street to an exercise uh, place. Uh, the, all of those help you age. And so one of the figures that's being thrown out there now is it can add about seven years to your life by uh, looking at ways to make your life simpler in a, in a more healthy way. And in particular, this is senior living, correct? Senior living, yeah. senior housing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's senior living can be so many different things. There's senior living housing communities, you know, 55 and they socially engage with people. It's engaging with people close to your own age right. and uh, doing things together, doing activities. Some of them go on cruises. Some of them go on buses to casinos. They have happy hours. They uh, engage in hobbies and, and different activities like that, as well as encouraged to exercise uh, as well. So all of those lead to a healthier way of living, including exercising your mind. And I've got to believe that it's got to be largely the community that's created, the, the social is. atmosphere really that gets created. I don't know if you've ever read the book uh, Blue Zones, but yeah. where they've done studies on yep, you know, what, what leads to longevity, and it yeah. is this closeness, this community. And if we're, especially if we're widowed or we're divorced, we're single, living at home, that can lead to significantly shorter lifespan. It can, and I think that's one of the examples that we, we share a lot is living somewhere where you can have the same kind of conversation and memories together, whereas if you're telling your story to possibly a millennial today, while they might be very respectful and say, uh-huh, hmm, interesting, mm, no, I don't, can't really relate to that. A lot of times when you're living in, whether it be a retirement community or a 55 plus neighborhood in houses, a lot of the people there have the same memories, things that we did at that time, mm -hmm. shows we watched, et cetera. Well, and one of the risks to that that I've talked to uh, some other guests about uh, is not being around youth, uh, not having younger yeah. people in those communities can can also be a danger. But it, now there's some of these communities that are uh, purposefully, you know, positioning the communities even close to. Uh, Absolutely. That's yeah. that's the new de developments. Housing developments are building multi-generational. So. Uh, this, the housing may be for the kids and grandkids and things, but they place senior living communities or 55 nice. neighborhoods within a that have are kind of gated off for uh, 55 and older to live in, but surrounded by communities where the kids are may live and the grandkids can come visit grandma and grandpa real easy. In and the same place, yeah, so which is good. It's pretty exciting, I think. Yeah, that connection to younger generations. I've I've seen studies showing you know how how much uh, better we age, how much longer we live, the sharper our mind stays, being connected. Well, I really want to really figure out what senior living is. Uh, so I just want to go a little bit deeper there. When you talk about senior living options. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what even typically comes to somebody's mind. I, I feel like most people think, well, that's assisted living or, or that's, I, I, I don't know. How do you define, define these senior living options? What are they? Uh, there's a wide range, right? Well, there, there, really, uh, there really is. And I think that that's one of the things where um, people that have not been involved with possibly a loved one that's gone to a retirement community or maybe their memories are of grandma going to the nursing home those types of communities, while nursing homes are still needed and present, so much has changed in senior living now because seniors are looking for and requiring to have those options. So now, as we spoke about before, there are 55 plus apartments. So it's just like having an apartment, except for the restriction is you have to be 55 to live there. You're still paying for your water, your electric, your gas but you're, the group that lives there is 55. Grandkids can spend the night, but can't live there with you. There are, and you're still living on your own at that point, doing everything for yourself, cooking for yourself. 
Then we get to um, independent housing, which is more senior community related. And now we're talking about still having your own apartment, but some of those services are factored into your monthly rent, housekeeping, uh, one or two meals uh, in the restaurant. Those are factored in there. Uh, and of course, security is a big deal. Uh, that's in independent living. Still have a full kitchen, still can have the kids over for the weekend for dinner. Most don't, but you have all that. Assisted living seems to be coming more of a common term. Yeah, they live in assisted living now. And assisted living is really when we start to age and have a higher level of care need. It can be as simple as help with medication. You're not able to really do that for yourself well. Or help with bathing because you've had a, a, a hip replacement or some kind of a fall and you're not as mobile as you used to be. Or help with dressing. That's when you need assistance, which is assisted living. And, of course, there's a couple of different types of that. John's mom started in independent living, had a fall, and moved to assisted living. And now for right. her... well. She's 98 years old now, and uh, yeah, she uses a walker, and it, 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 well, if you can imagine being 98, uh, you need a little help, and uh, so she, in the community she lives at, they have three meals a day, and uh, there's help to help her get into the bathroom to shower and that type of thing, and um, so it's just a higher level of, of care. And then from there, you know, some other things to keep in mind is sometimes when it's a couple that lives together in assisted living, it may be because one member of that couple is starting to experience memory, memory problems, but not enough so that they need to be in uh, memory care, but they need to be somewhere close by where they can be observed. And then, of course, over time, that changes when there's uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. And then now we move to memory care. And memory care is a secure setting. There is a code to get in and a code to get out because often um, that person might forget where they are, be confused about how to enter or exit a building or a number of things. Um, we here in Texas see often now, even more so than Amber Alerts, we see on the uh, highways the big uh, marquees that will say silver alert mm -hmm. where someone has gone out and started driving and just have, has gotten lost and, uh, you know, confused. So memory care is another piece of that. And then we go from there to uh, skilled nursing. And then we're looking at 24-7 care. So it's more of uh, a hospital-type environment for skilled nursing, but often people that, uh, for example, have a knee replacement or a hip replacement or some kind of surgery where they're not rehabbing as fast as they used to. And of course, with today's insurance, they don't want to keep you in the hospital for an extended stay. So they will go to rehab in uh, assisted living or sometimes even in skilled nursing, depending upon what's close and what's available for them to match what their insurance will pay for. And in our book, towards the back with the resources, we have a graphic there that identifies all of those. So we've got 55 plus communities, independent housing, assisted living, memory care, skilled care, uh, skilled nursing care, that is. And hey, there are services out there, communities that combine all these, right? Yeah, Con right. Continuing They're, care, retirement exactly. communities. Continuing care, retirement they, sometimes communities. Sometimes they call them life care communities, mm -hmm. and sometimes they call them continuing care communities. And Every couple of years, there's new hybrids forming of, of these different kinds of communities. As they learn more what people need, they're adjusting them to, uh, you know, fit the needs of people. And it, one thing I was going to say, a lot of people start out in those 55 plus communities, and, and typically they're apartments, but they're usually luxury apartments with all kinds of activities. A, a lot of them have demo kitchens, so people get together and they'll have potlucks together or food demonstrations. Uh, they do they parties uh, several times a week <laughs> or some kind of activities to bring them together socially. And they're strategically placing them in close to shopping, so the walkability is very close, so they could walk to restaurants or, or uh, grocery stores and that type of thing as well. 
And then there would be the tradition, say, age in place, setting up your home to age in place, or just downsizing, right? Just finding right. a smaller home that's a better fit. I think these all, those all kind of fall under that, that umbrella, I would think. And I think for many, they're going to be kind of surprised that there's a realtor out there to help them evaluate all these different options, find the one that's right for them, uh, because I... I, I was kind of surprised to find you guys. That's that's why I was so excited to talk to you. I saw you quoted in an article. And I said, oh, I, I, I need to talk to these people. I didn't know there was someone that specialized in evaluating the right option uh, rather than just, well, they're just going to sell me a home. They're just going to take me out of my larger home and put me in a smaller home. You're doing a lot more than that. Right. Well, we do. Um, and, you know, just to be really frank about it, it's all about the relationship. And this type of move for somebody in this age range is so much different than your first home or your second home. It's the home that they've been in, in a lot of cases, 40, 50 years, that has a lot of memories in it that we're now talking about letting go of to move to something that everybody says will be better for you. So it's a timing thing for us. Uh, a lot of our clients are not ready to move right away. They don't want to be uh, in that 30-day, find a place and get out of here. They want to take the time and have somebody work closely with them and make them feel okay with it because oftentimes uh, the push is coming from the opposite side. The family is wanting to push them. Let's get it going. You need to be somewhere else. And, and for us, we find that our clients are saying, I'm not sure what to do here. My kids don't want my things. Help mm -hmm. me figure out the best thing. Then we'll go step by step. So we build a plan for them so they feel like we're partners in this. Yeah, a lot of times we start working with our clients a year, maybe two years before they're ready to move or sell wow. their house, but they start thinking about it and putting a plan together right. for that. And we just got a call. We, we had a consultation with a couple about a month ago and told them the things they need to look at it, taking care of their house. And uh, the husband had just started a new job in Dallas and they lived in Fort Worth and they were thinking about moving out of their house to be closer and into to a senior community. And uh, Ingrid just got a call from him uh, two days ago. It says, well, we decided to postpone it for another year, but we're, we're going to stay in touch so you can help us get ready yeah. for that. And yeah. So that's, that's a lot of what we do is coaching people through the process, right. whether it's 90 days or two years. From We've now. given them a list of things to do. So it's kind of like a homework assignment. And then periodically we check back with them or they'll call us and say, okay, I've got all these things done on my list. What else do I need to do? So that we can make it an easier transition versus out the door and into something strange. What, what we don't want to do, which is probably maybe 50% is, some event has happened, whether a, a health change or a death of a spouse, and they weren't planned, and, you know, then they're stressed out, and we go in and uh, help them out, and we hope to help people and avoid that situation. Right, the crisis. You know, we want to hear our clients say, oh, I'm so glad I moved in here. I wished I hadn't waited so long, or I waited too long, and now I'm at a different level of care. And so, you know, it's, it's not the same thing. Well, what you do seems very unique. And I just think this can be so overwhelming because there's not just so many options today, but they can tend to multiply exponentially all the different options we have and all the things we need to understand and evaluate the team that we need to put together. And it's a great time to be in this business. You've got baby boomers that are reaching that age, one of the largest generations in history, and they're going to need help making these types of decisions. It's a lot like making financial decisions, putting together retirement plans. Well, I've got to evaluate social security and tax planning and income planning and investment planning and estate planning. I've got to know all these different things. I need to find a specialist. And I, I didn't know specialists like you exist. Is this something that is unique? Is it as unique as I believe it is? Or is this something that you can find no matter what part of the country that you're in? Uh, I would say um, unique in it's unique in the way that we built our business to grow it in a timeline that works well for our clients. And there aren't, um, in most real estate transactions, they're like this, on the market, off the market, let's move forward. So I belong to a group of certified senior housing professionals. Uh, there's about 150 of us that meet once a year at a conference. 
and we talk about what's going on in senior living and what changes have, ha have happened and how can we fine tune our businesses even more. And we work really closely together to build our businesses in a similar way so that when a referral comes to us from maybe a, a, a daughter that lives here in Texas, but their parent is going to go live with the brother in Florida and they need help or vice versa, we have a referral base that we can actually help them out with. So that they're working with somebody that has a similar touch as we do versus just giving them a name and hoping that they're going to have the service that we give. And I don't know if maybe we can provide some kind of link or something in the show notes to allow people to access who those people are that might be in their area or how you would want them to go about finding them. If they're in Texas, they got to call you. Now, yeah. if they're somewhere else, what should they do? Right. Well, we like to work through referral for obvious reasons. Uh, one of the things that's important about that is that if uh, the client were to call and say, I've got a parent that lives in New York, and um, I'm going through the same things that I heard you talk about on the show. Who are some people that I can talk to? We kind of ask them a few questions, only not to manage the situation, but kind of identify what's the pers right person to refer them to. Well, mm -hmm. and I, I want to go back to your original question is, are we unique? And I would say yes. And the uh, certified senior housing professionals, which Ingrid referred to with about 150, most of us, the majority of our business is about helping seniors. That's 90% mm -hmm. of my, my business. Yeah, we help. I'm signing a contract with a first-time home buyer tonight. And so we still help those people. But because that's what we focus on and have surrounded ourselves with, we're very equipped to do it and we're very passionate about it. Now, National Association of Realtors has a designation called Senior Real Estate Specialist, SRES. Mm -hmm. They... That's a two-day class, and people get it because they're interested in it, but most of them haven't surrounded themselves with everything. But let me cut to the chase again. If people call us, sometimes if there's not a certified senior housing professional in their area, Ingrid and I have called, found SRES people in the area and interviewed them and try to find the right person that right. can yeah. help somebody. Right. So that's one of the things we do. We don't make anything right. off it, but we, we just want to help people to make sure they're getting the right, right. people. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have your contact information, your website and everything in the show notes at retirewithpurpose.com. If you want to check that out in the show notes, you'll have everything you need. So don't worry about jotting these things down while you're driving down the highway right now. Um, but, you know, I want to talk about your experiences personally with your moms. I know both of you kind of went through this discussion. I've got to imagine, you know, having you two as kids uh, could be quite the blessing as we're going through this, but <laughs> it might also be a little intimidating so. now <laughs> as well. So I, I just love, I think you had two very different experiences with your, your parents. Um, yeah. So I don't know who wants to start, but uh, you can just kind of share with us what that was I like. I think uh, the historical order, I will start with my mom, because that's really what led us to say we're going to focus on what we do now. I'm my uh, dad, too. Yeah, your dad. Uh, but about 10 years ago, uh, my mom had lived in a house that I grew up in for over 60 years. My father passed in 1986. And uh, my brother and I, he also lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, were always at my mom's house a couple times a week. I'd go and lay all of her medication out and medication reminder things and uh, pay her bills. And it got to be that there may be, there was actually one good neighbor across the street that had lived there for 30 years and they were close to, and they would help them out. Well, my mom used to drive and go to exercise classes several times a week, water aerobics, and then macular degeneration took the car away. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't active. So we started looking at independent living communities. Mm -hmm. And we went through that for about two years before my mom decided she was ready. And part of that was because she had blood pressure spikes and sometimes she would just pass out from that and mm. fall. So with the help of our doctor, we convinced her to move to a community. And 
that experience was, what do we do with all the stuff? My brother and I, we did garage sales and that didn't get rid of anything. And ultimately I hired somebody with a huge truck and trailer to haul off and paid them 800 bucks to do that. And had I known then what I know now, I wouldn't have had to pay anybody to haul that stuff off. But anyway, that whole process and get my mom's house ready to sell uh, just led us to say there's a better way. So we started uh, surrounding ourselves with, everybody we needed and taking the education that we needed to to get into this business. Casey, when uh, John's mom first moved into a Brookdale community, uh, the marketing uh, director there asked, uh, came, approached me and said, you know, I know that you're a real estate agent. Um, while the majority of our uh, residents that live here don't really have homes anymore, they still want to know what's going on in the real estate market for investment purposes. Hmm. Would you come in twice a year and do a seminar for us on a real estate minute? What's going on in the real estate market? And the first time that I started doing that, I had probably 10 people there and, you know, told them about what's going on in, around us, how many days on market, average price, all of those things. Uh, the second time, the second six months later, when I came back, the room had doubled. And I actually had people coming up to me afterwards saying, I still have my house. I've been living here for a while. I really don't know what to do with it. My kids are busy. I can't take that on. It needs repairs. I'm paying taxes on it. Can you help? And that's where we kind of got the idea that there's, there's a community out there that's paralyzed. And how do we, how do we help them with that? Mm -hmm. Which is when we started seeking out the partners that we have. I will shift to my mother. My mother uh, lives, and we're in Texas. My mother lived in New Mexico. And none of us were close to her. Um, my mom was one that uh, I'm first generation American for my family. And my mom was one that said, honey, I love everything that you do. It's so wonderful how you help people and, uh, you know, help them make a move, but not for me. I'm staying here. I'm going to stay in my house. I love my garden. I'm going to die in my house. And um, she did. She, uh, we had a sudden health decline, um, cancer, and uh, it was a three-month thing that she was here and gone. Uh, that was really sad because any one of us would have taken her to be with us and be close to our grandkids that she didn't get to know very well because mm -hmm. she lived somewhere else. Uh, but what came out of that, if there's anything good that could come out of that, is that our business and the way that we conduct our business with our clientele through their real estate sales and their estate sales prepared me to be able to go to New Mexico and seek out an estate liquidator to manage that the right way because I know how it's supposed to be done and to interview uh, uh, the right real estate agent to get her house sold. Uh, so that was a, a sad thing because she chose to live alone we had cameras in her house where we could look in on her anytime during the day to make sure she was okay. But she was uh, determined that she was going to stay there. And there are people out there that want to do that. And sometimes I, we have to just know there, there's nothing we can do. We have to yeah. surrender at yeah. some point. Be right? respectful and say, I understand that. Yeah. But yeah. I, I love the camera idea. That, that, that yeah. makes a lot it was of sense. really great. It was because any time of the day, any of the four of us could just check in. And see, I mean, it was, you know, in the kitchen, in the backyard, in the living room, no private places. But uh, she and she knew that we were watching so that we could say, hey, we saw you cooking in the kitchen last night. What were you making? You know, <laughs> so she could still feel like we were doing uh, watching her being with her. And we had sure. a, a frame, a picture frame that she sat in the kitchen that we could use with our cell phones and take pictures of what we were doing at the time. And it would show up on that frame immediately. So instead of having a picture on the refrigerator of her granddaughter when she was three months old versus the one where she's seven, she had absolutely everything going on every day, all the time. Do you by any chance know what that was? I've never heard uh, of that. The name of that company is Siva. C-E-I-V-A. 
it's Very a great neat. tool. Yeah, I can I can see enjoying that with uh, with our parents mm -hmm. as well. So, John, did you experience any objections from your mom during this process? Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like I said, <clears throat> we went through encouraging her to move for about almost two years. We'd visit a, a community, and and she when it came to put up the deposit, she'd go, "No, I'm not ready." And then, um, so keep encouraging. And uh, finally, like I said, she her blood pressure was causing her. And one time I was over helping her with something, and I just happened to look up, and she was falling, and I caught her. And uh, both of us used to go to the same doctor. So I told my doctor, I said, Dr. Dubstad, you've got to talk to mom. And, and uh, strongly encourage her. Uh, to move to a safer place. And so uh, that conversation helped her go forward. And, you know, she found a new crew to hang out, to go have coffee with all of her, her yeah. friends every morning and things. And so uh, sure. that, that was nice. Participating. Highway mom's 98. Yeah, she's 98 yeah. now. Yeah, well, that I, probably helped. I wanted to add something to that that we did for her as well. And we often bring that up to our clients' uh, family. Um, it typically takes about 90 days when someone makes a move, especially to a senior community, for them to feel like, okay, this is home now, about 90 days. So when she moved, we told her, we're not going to do anything with your house. We're going to wait. We're going to let you make that decision when you want us to let that go. But we're going to update it anyway so that, you know, it's, it's, up, it's up to date with what's going on. And it was, what, maybe a month and a half? that she was tired of paying the water bill and the bills over there because she had already made the decision. But we let her feel like she was still in charge and that we weren't going to sell yeah, her house until point. she was ready. Yeah, that was part of the bargain is we're not going to sell your house. Right. Do you want to come in home? In case you want to move back, it's there. We're going to leave but it alone. Well, I can see that being some good insight for those out there that are uh, maybe their children, they're concerned about mom, they're concerned about dad, how do we go about this conversation. Uh, do you have any other tips that you might share with a child that wants to approach this conversation uh, yeah. with their parents, or maybe they're going through a struggle, a difficult time in making that, uh, uh, convincing them that that's the healthy, right thing for them? Well, it can be, I can tell you that it can be hard on uh, the children because they want to do right by mom. Uh, they don't want to change things for them because they know how important it is that they're living in the home that they grew up in maybe. But a good time, especially we found around the holidays when everybody's getting together, a good time to start that conversation is asking questions like, if you were made to make a change, not that we're pushing you to do that, but if you were to make a change, what would that look like? If you could live anywhere you want to live right now, what would that look like for you? Would you want to live close to me? Would you want to live close to our brother? Do you want to stay close to the church that you, uh, where all your friends are? What would that look like for you? And a lot of times just, just talking about, Mom, if something were to happen to you, a stroke, for example, and you weren't able to communicate with me, on what you want us to do next. We want to do the right thing by you. So it's always helpful just to share that and communicate it with us so that we can save that for the right time. Yeah, it's, like I said, it took a while to do my mom. And, and Ingrid and I have belonged to a support group called Children of Aging Parents. And you hear the whole spectrum of stories. Mm -hmm. And when, especially if your parents live in another city, it can be stressful. Mm -hmm. So we are, try to encourage them just to talk about getting their parents to plan and uh, be helpful, you know, say, what, what do you want? Or what if your health changes? And also if they don't have that documents in order, like the uh, powers of attorney and that type of thing, okay. that's important to encourage that. If they do, another tip we share is those documents need to be reviewed every three to five years mm -hmm. because the law changes and financial institutions don't want to take a, a 
seven or eight year old power of attorney mm -hmm. necessarily. So they need to be updated regularly. Uh, there's a great book that we've read a couple times and we recommend it to, to everybody. It's called, whether you're a professional like yourself, uh, working with aging adults, it's called How to Say It to Seniors by David Soleil. And his last name is S-O-L-I-E. Yeah, we will put that in the link. It would really yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's that. a great book. It's a great read, especially for children of aging parents. Because awesome. it's all about leaving a legacy, right? And that's what's important is to, to um, identify the fact that it's their dignity. They may not be driving anymore. All they have left is their home. That's the one thing that they can claim for themselves. And you want to make your... Uh, your parent feel like you're doing this as a team and more importantly because you want them to be safe they feel very guilty that they're asking you to help them I'm sure you hear often I don't want to be a burden to my children so just having that conversation not using those words but having that conversation and giving your parent a chance to talk about it what is it is it scary for you and and why would it be or make it a fun day say gosh there's so many great senior communities let's take next week and pick a couple because they'll feed us lunch let's go there and take a tour and see what they're all about so that we have some ideas on what's even out there and what are some of the or if you could just pick one really important lesson the most important lesson that you learned from helping mom downsize what would it be <laughs> uh, just one helping them um you know parents and i can say i'm one of them parents have a tendency to want to to care for things and keep them for their children whether it be dishes whether it be a family heirlooms um help the client understand that their kids may not want their things and that it's that's okay that there are lots of places right now that there will be somebody that's going to love it like they did. But help them understand that it's okay that their kids are not going to want that, that china or some of those other things. Um, it's overwhelming for someone that's lived in their home a long time that has their mother's this and their grandmother's that, and now they have it. It's overwhelming for them to even fathom how do I start to break that down. Let them, feel, let them feel that it's going to be okay to take their time and they don't have to do it all at one time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that you have helped to help them. Well, my tip is for parents, for their kids, or just or your spouse, get your planning in order. Mm -hmm. Pre-needs planning. Ingrid and I just went through that process, and actually it was kind of fun. <laughs> but mm -hmm. we know that our son if something happens to one or both of us or whatever, or, or if I go and Ingrid has to do it, you don't have to worry about all those funeral arrangements. It's paid for. You outline exactly how you want it to go, and uh, it just takes the stress off the family. The documents, like I said, keep your documents like powers of attorneys and trust updated because in the event uh, something bad happens, uh, those are just – lifesavers for your family mm -hmm. by having those things put in order. Well, you two are over 55. And so what, what have you done? What are you doing to um, make this less stressful at some point in the future on your kids outside of, say, estate planning? Um, what, what are you doing to avoid some of the stress that, say, John, you experience and Ingrid, you both experience these stresses with your moms? Um, mm -hmm. What are you going to do differently to make sure your kids don't have to go through that? Go ahead. Well, I just told you, yeah, we're getting a new trust done, and you said it's besides that. But, you know, uh, we've got stuff, and so I try to practice what I preach every once in a while. I've, I've gone through my closet a couple times in the last six months, and I keep finding more and more. And uh, so I'm just trying to rid of some things and we're finding out even some of the stuff we were saving for our son he doesn't want and so we're uh, finding more storage in our house by getting rid of all of that stuff so it, it's just starting to have that mindset and, and you know we're thinking about where we want to live and mm -hmm. uh, 
those type of things as we age as well. So. I could, I, and I, you know, I can add something to that. If we have time, uh, I just had an experience uh, that I'd like to share with you. I had a, a very close friend from church um, uh, that was uh, somebody that had everything in place, had uh, all of his finances in place, et cetera. And um, I helped them with a couple of real estate transactions. Um, they moved into their brand new house. This is just three weeks ago. They moved into their brand new house and they were headed out to dinner. He and his wife backing out of the driveway and he had a heart attack in the car. That was it. It was that kill, that was just took him at that point. Um, the, none of the kids lived here. Uh, they're all flying in from somewhere else, and they're all scrambling trying to figure out what is the password to get onto Dad's computer. Um, how do we get into Dad's email account? Because there's information there on mm -hmm. one of the properties that we're currently selling that we were needing. Um, it's very stressful for your family because I want to do the right thing by you but you need to give them the tools to do that. And um, when I ask a question, do your parents have a Facebook account? Um, often now they'll say yes. Do you know how to log into it? I have no clue. Are your parents on email? Well, not that much, but yeah, they are. Those are the things that are important to make available to your children. There's a digital inventory in our book. That's a great yep. place to I'm jump. I'm looking at it right yeah. here. Yeah. 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 I I think that's uh it's really insightful because we've yeah, you know, we've always had say estate planning, but there's right. digital estate planning that yeah. needs to be done as well. Yeah. Uh, this can be one of the most vital things today is right. well, where are the passwords to right. the bank accounts, et cetera. Where is all that stuff? Right. And a lot of times we don't know. We haven't communicated it yet. Well, uh, it, well it, they it, discovered that dad had a bank account somewhere that nobody really knew, but they but they got a statement in the mail while they were there. Right. So, you know, uh, the, the wife uh, in this particular case has just been recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So the whole dynamics of all of that for the kids is really scary because they want to make sure, not living here, that they have everything they need to make it all work out well in the end. Well, and I don't know if the two of you have already, maybe you've already downsized. Uh, maybe you've already started that process. You've talked a lot about stuff and estate planning. Do you have any plans yourself on downsizing at some point in the future? And, and if so, or if you already did that, what might that look like for you two? Well, we have, we actually have talked about it. Um, we, there, the new the new homes that are being built today, especially in the 55 communities for those types of builders are two bedroom, two bath with a study. Uh, you know, usually they're 1700 and under square feet, but they're uh, appointed well, open living, wider hallways, uh, something that you can actually age in place. And that's really appealing to us uh, because, um, John's not really doing, well, par partially because of our business, but uh, keeping up with the yard and keeping up with all the things uh, that there are, it makes it easier for us. That some of the newer communities, Casey, are taking care of all of the upkeep, the outside upkeep, the streets, the lawns, the everything. All we have to be involved with is inside because they're deeded like condos, even though mm -hmm. they're single family homes. Um, those are things to be looking for and, and better ways to, uh, to manage your money to do those things. So you said it typically takes about one to two years before someone uh, makes that actual change after they've engaged with you and started this consultation process. You know, at what point in your life, uh, what age, what characteristics, at what point, point should you start evaluating these options? Well, <clears throat> Studies say that people are living in their homes longer and, you know, they're waiting. A lot of our clients are in their late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and then we've had some that as soon as they turn 65, they're ready to, to yeah. downsize. As, I've as got well. a, so, a couple but, I work with, they turn 60 and they're ready to move into yeah. a continuing care retirement community. I mean, really? Oh, wow. Already? Wow. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah wow. they, so, but I'd say the majority of them are, are waiting, but I, I would just say, you know, in your 60s, start thinking about what it looks like to you uh, and, and, and have a plan in place because right. life changes happen so fast. So if you 
got some preparation in mind, but a lot of people, like I said, where our house was built in 86 and we've updated it and taken good care of it, but still there's always something going out in the mm -hmm. hot water. We just replaced yeah. the AC system and things. And so uh, moving to a, a new home 55 community that's surrounded with multi-generational and I can walk to all these things and there's walking trails, uh, that's appealing to us. And I would say in the next year or two, we're, we may be making right. that move as well as getting a vacation house somewhere else. Yeah, my mom lived in a 55 plus community for a while and it was a beautiful apartment, beautiful view, and it was very well maintained. Everybody was very nice. And I thought, geez, it's too bad I can't get in here. <laughs> well, when I first go, started going to places with uh, my mom to the independent community, I was going, this is like a cruise ship, you know? All these good <laughs> it's so simple. Yeah. Yeah. Happy hours several times a week. I said, how old yeah. do I need to be to move here? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would just say, um, have, align yourself with someone that's aware of senior housing. That's That would be a tip for somebody. Align yourself with someone that's aware of senior housing, not just I heard of this over there. Somebody that knows about it and all the options that go with it. And a great financial planner that can tell them if they have enough money to make that happen. Because real, realistically, as you know, it's all about the money in the beginning. Yeah. Do I have enough to make it work? Well, that's going to be that's one of my questions is, I, mean, I think sometimes, you know, and we'll meet with people and say, well, I'm going to downsize at some point in retirement, acting like it's going to save them just a ton of money. And many times it actually costs them more to go through the downsizing process and actually downsize. And part of that is they're moving to someplace like Texas or Arizona or Florida. They're, living, they're moving someplace where there's a higher cost of living than, you know, in the countryside of Indiana, you know, or, or Michigan or Ohio, you know, they're moving from a low cost living to a higher cost living, or they've got to fix up the house before they're able to move. Uh, maybe they have a negative mortgage. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what would you say to, can you just kind of speak to the costs of downsizing? You know, that was one of the things that we looked at when um, you had uh, sent us some of the questions for review today. And that's kind of a hard a hard number to pin down to because it really does depend on where somebody is when somebody's going to be making that move um you know and and as far as the real estate's concerned it depends on what's going on in the real estate market at the time you know for us in a lot of cases right now we have people that they don't want to deal with showings coming in and out of their house being inconvenienced having to move things around so that people can see things they're looking more for um the easy button if you will. How can I find somebody that's going to come in and pay me something that I'm looking for where I don't have to do anything and I can move on? We're starting to see a lot more of that interest than the long-term real estate transaction. Um, I, I think that... Um, well, I'll just have a couple thoughts on that. One of the worksheets in our book is is it says, you know, what does it cost me to live into this senior community? Mm -hmm. and, and then you add up, all, even if you don't have an mortgage, you got property taxes, uh, homeowners insurance, maybe an HOA fee, utility, mm -hmm. maintenance on the house. And a lot of people are surprised to find out that they're paying almost as much as it, even if they pay several thousand a month to right. rent in a senior right. community. So sometimes it's a wash and the the stress they save of having to deal with the house is worth it, you know. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we found uh, is, a, you know, estate sales, we work a lot with people. That's how they get rid of a lot of their stuff. And so a couple tips there is don't throw anything away and assume it won't sell an estate mm -hmm. sale. Uh -huh. I, I tell everybody a half full bottle of Windex will sell in a, an estate sale, so everything mm -hmm. sells. But the money they could, let's say uh, the estate sale brings ten thousand, and typical estate sale fees are about forty percent. That's six thousand bucks, and that a lot of times pays for the cost of hiring them, a, a a packer to come in mm -hmm. and help you go through everything and unpack you when you get there, mm -hmm. and the moving costs. And so a lot of those can be covered by what you can reap out of an estate right. sale. Right. Uh, so. 
those are some things to consider. So now we've got movers, we've got realtors, we've got estate planners. I mean, (laughs) you mentioned in your book having a a downsizing dream team. So what does a downsizing dream team look like? Who's on it? Well, I would, I would tell you on our team for us, the people that belong to our team is we have from the real estate side of it, we have the real, real estate agents. We have the handyman contractors to go in and make the repairs or updates that are needed to get the home ready to sell. We have uh, several different types of estate liquidators because not everybody wants to do an in-home. Sometimes they're online. We have the packer that will come in and pack the things for you that you're taking with you. And the packer orchestrates the move. We also have a buyout guy. So that when the estate sale is held and not everything sells, we got somebody that's going to buy the rest and haul off the rest. That's that's our team. And we've all been uh, working together closely for the last uh, 10 years. And we've added, uh, we have an elder law attorney that works with us as well. Uh, because, again, as those things are starting to happen, we want to make sure all the paperwork's in place. Yeah. That's pretty neat. I can't imagine the the amount of confidence that you have once you have all these people to help you, how much stress is relieved from your life, especially once you've put it all behind you. You've talked a lot about planning and you've talked about this plan, having this downsizing plan. What is what is the downsizing plan? What's that look like? Uh, well, the downsizing plan is uh, having a consultation with a professional that uh, is going to be assisting you in that talking about the long term, uh, what type of living are you, what is your goal? Where are you wanting to go? Are you wanting to move to a house? Are you wanting to move to a retirement community? Uh, Getting floor plans so we can talk about how much stuff are you going to be able to take? Uh, Having our our packer come in and do a walkthrough with you on your home to help you figure out what's going to go with you and what's not then marking the things that are going to go with you and those things that are going to be left behind for the estate liquidator when they come to do their walkthrough with you. Um, And uh, then when are we going to put the house on the market? Are you going to move first? Are we going to sell it? And then you'll, um, you'll live in it and then we'll move afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, Pretty much. I think a big part of it is all this stuff that you accumulate over the years. We just lived in our uh, our, our first home for about five years, and uh, we were lucky enough to have a house fire. So it was very easy as we moved from that location to the next location. Yeah, really. <laughs> but it really was amazing how much stuff there still was there that we still had to go through after everything that we lost. And then you go, well, we only lived here for five years. What if we lived somewhere for 50 years? And you've talked a lot about stuff. You've talked about down sizing your stuff. And I think this, this really leads me into a question we had from one of our weekend readers. Uh, for those of you that have signed up for weekend reading for retirees, that's an email we send out every Friday with four articles on trending retirement topics. Uh, we invite you to uh, ask our guests some questions. And uh, we had several questions. I won't be able to get to all of them, but I have one uh, from Kevin Lynch that I, I I really think speaks to what you're talking about here. He says he's 62 years old. I uh, says I'm working to at least 66. I currently own my farm of 25 acres and a large home with other outbuildings. I want to downsize to a three bedroom, two bath home on one acre. So he wants to downsize. Uh, then he says, what other downsizing can I do? Uh, my paid for home is my largest investment. I live alone. Thank you. And, and I, and that got me thinking at first I go, well, I guess you could go to a two bedroom, one bath. However, all this talk about stuff seems to make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and I, I, I guess he's healthy. I mean, he still wants an acre, so that's a, a lot to take care of too. But uh, yes, from 25 acres without buildings and, and things that that is downsizing to him, that's quite a bit smaller and mm-hmm. things. And then, uh, assuming with all those buildings, there's lots of things that uh, he can release and possibly make money off of yes. to, well, to help fund it. his yeah. retirement and, and or the move yes. or the, the new home. And then, you know, also to be considering um, uh, as he's young, young now and still has the energy to do all those things, what's the, the end, the long plan? How long do you plan to stay in that house with the one acre 
and who is going to help mm -hmm. you with the maintenance, especially of the one acre while you're there. Yeah, and I think that's uh, what's overlooked many times, and maybe you agree, but we say, well, I'm downsizing, and you think you're done. However, there's still going to come that point in your life, maybe you're 80, 85, 95, you know, at some point, you're going to need some help, and you're going to have to move from that you know, three-bedroom, two-bath home with one acre to something that you know can offer you better care and avoid creating a lot of stress for the rest of your family. I think as I've read the stories in your your book and listen to you, you know, we have to think about the stress it creates for our kids, not just ourselves. Yes. And, you know, um, I helped somebody that had a family member that did not live here in the state of Texas, uh, that uh, I was the exec executress for her estate. And I have a whole new uh, respect for the term, you can't take it with you. Because yeah. when she was gone, I, as somebody that knew her only 10 years, was left with all kinds of things trying to decide what am I going to do when the family doesn't want it. And I really don't want to throw those things away. So yeah. it's, it's good to do uh, a yearly clean out and start to look at those things. They say if you have clothes hanging in the closet that have dust on the shoulders and you know you don't have dandruff, <laughs> it probably means that you haven't worn them for a while and it might be time to release them. <laughs> I'm I'm a, a hoarder of T-shirts. That's one mm -hmm. thing that it drives my wife. It drives me nuts. My wife was always saying, well, I, where, "What happened to my favorite T-shirt?" Well, I you've had it for years. It had holes in it. I know, but it's my favorite T-shirt. I don't want to get rid of it. You're I'm the same way with mugs. Out. We we all have a little little hoarder in us, right? I still <laughs> give my wife heck about uh, the all the mugs that she threw away. That, well, those were my favorite mugs. She didn't use all of them. So we all have a lot of stuff in different yep. ways. You're right. And um, a lot of that stuff is photos and pictures, especially like I think our generation, we won't have all these, you know, photo right. albums and things. You know, everything's digitally stored in some yeah. way. And Paula Horn uh, asked this question about that. She said, we have two large storage bins of photos and framed family photos. How do you downsize these items? Uh, there's a couple things. One, there's a, a company called Legacy Box, and uh, yeah. they'll send you a box, and you just put all your photos, uh, even if you have old Super 8 movies or whatever, uh -huh. yeah. and they'll digitize it all, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And we tell people, you know, get the digital frames, and you can see the photo. You'll, you'll enjoy them more than the photo right. albums, that's for sure, because right. they're playing around the house in digital yes. frames. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the, the two big things I think think of and it's funny we were uh rearranging a room where all the photo albums were and everything and i'm going through and seeing all these old photos but i hadn't looked at them some of them probably for 10 or 15 years since we got married <laughs> so yeah uh, that's what i need to do is get legacy box or yeah. go up to walgreens and start yeah. scanning them or yeah. whatever to uh everybody can relate to having those them. Bo shoe boxes full of pictures in a closet at the top underneath the yeah. something but it's so easy now to go ahead because eventually they age and they turn orange or something. So you can't really see what it is it's anyway. True. And if you still have good pictures of family members from years back, it's a great time to digitize that so that you can share that for your kids. I will say this, that my uh, youngest sister sat with my mother and over a period of five days, she recorded my mother telling about her life as she came over from Germany and what that was like um, and during the war, et cetera. And we each have a set of five CDs that it's my mother talking about our life. And especially right now that she's no longer with us, it's really a nice thing for me to have and for me to share with my son yeah, and his that's kids. That's a great idea. Well, I've seen that I've seen that method used, and then I've seen people take those recordings and send them off to a writer, uh, and have them turn it into a book as well. Oh, and the nice. book can be a legacy that lives forever. Book in a box is yeah. is one of those services. Uh, I've got a, one other question that I think is really good. That uh, I don't I don't know how many people can relate to this today, the way the real estate market's been. But I'm sure there, I mean there must be quite a few people out there still like this. Uh, Emily has a question asking. Um, Casey, uh, what if uh, mom and dad have a negative mortgage? My mom has that. So they want to downsize. They have a negative mortgage. What would your guidance guidance be? Well, I, so they're underwater. 
is it a reverse mortgage? Number one, if it's a reverse mortgage, they can walk away from it. Uh, it uh, is a reverse mortgage. Mm -hmm. It, well, if there's no equity, uh, they should be able to walk away from it. Right. Now, they're not going to get insured. any money, but it's a federally insured loan. And so... Uh, Which doesn't impact their credit. Doesn't impact their, their credit or anything. And the, the kids aren't liable for it or, or anyway. That's, you can walk away. I would also ask them to consult a local realtor, and it, maybe they already have. But if it's a reverse mortgage, ultimately they can walk away, and then it's up to the... Uh, FHA to sell it as a foreclosure after that. Mm -hmm. So even though there's no equity, mom can walk away. Mom and dad can walk away from the home and the bank takes over the equity in the home. Now they own it and it's their responsibility. There's, there's nothing owed and there's nothing they're going to be able to come back to them. Oh. On. Right. And, and typically um, what we've learned because we uh, have had quite a few home equity conversion mortgages for purchase uh, here in our area, but typically if something like that happens, they can't make another loan like that for three years. Okay. Interesting. I think that'll be really helpful for Emily out there uh, to continue the reverse mortgage discussion. Um, we do get this question from time to time, uh, individuals asking if it's better to downsize their home and reinvest the proceeds, the, the difference between the two, uh, and, or just keep it and plan on doing a reverse mortgage at some point down the road? Kind of depends on the condition yeah, of the house. It depends on the, the individual and, uh, you know, what they're planning to do to the house and, and things like that. Sometimes it may be better to sell it and get something newer. Uh, it, it's hard to say uh, without knowing the individual situation. Okay. We do have uh, a lender here, uh, Retirement Funding Solutions, that has uh, done seminars for uh, our clients and several of the builders on doing a home equity conversion mortgage for purchase. And one of the things that uh, has been an eye-opener for our client is that depending upon their age, it's one of the few things, the older you are, the less you pay. So example, a uh, $375,000 home, they would be bringing about $185,000 to closing and they would be done. But what they now have is a new home that's uh, wider doorways, the right amount of space. Um, so, And what they're uh, responsible for is property taxes and HOA dues if those mm -hmm. are involved. But there have been several people that have taken advantage of that because it's uh, more attractive to them to have something newer. So they've used their uh, home equity conversion mortgage. Their, right. their they reverse sold their mortgage. home and took the proceeds from the sale of their home and put it at, as the down payment on the home equity conversion mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so now the new home has a reverse mortgage on it. Yeah, right. So um, it, it, and it depends on everybody's situation. I mean, I, I've known financial planners that use that product because they felt it was the mm -hmm. best deal to do it and, and some people it may not be because it keeps the, the, the clients best. investments and equity growing and they don't have to take that money away from other things they can keep that growing and still have the news mm -hmm. well if you have questions about reverse mortgages i would encourage you to go back to the dr wade fow um a discussion we had uh i think I believe that was episode 11 uh we had on his book we actually still have uh i don't know maybe a half a dozen reverse mortgage books from dr wade fow in the office so if you would like to take us up on that just uh reach out to us we'll see if we can get one out to you so I was actually having this conversation uh, earlier with our producer asking, uh, talking to her about something I read in your book called The Granny Pod. So tell us about The Granny Pod. Uh, well, it, it's a company, I believe they were out of Maryland, and, and uh, I think the gentleman who started it um, did it for his own mother's personal thing, but they created these that can be shipped, and they're all smart technology create uh, equipped is what I should say. And um, uh, so they have cameras in them that you can even set it, you know, the smart homes. Now you can have Alexa remind you to take a pill and that type of thing. But so they built it to be safe, very small. And then it could be uh, set in the backyard of the children or something like that. And so you'd have mom or dad or both close to you 
but they have their own space. We right. actually have a friend in our office who uh, they actually built a, a little home like a granny pod for their uh, father to live there. He, he He's widowed and things and his health was going down. So they equipped it and they, you know, made it with wide doorways, lower counters for him to get around and uh, just made it especially for him and made it a smart home so it's easy uh, to re- take care of him and check well, in with him. It's, you know, and what John says with the smart home, Casey, is that it, it manages, it watches the number of steps. It watches the number of times that that individual has uh, gone to the bathroom. Uh, so, and there's reports that can be printed out on that. But that individual still feels the, the autonomy of I'm on my own. I'm not living with my kids. I've got my own place on the back 40 of the property. They're still here. I don't have to drive to them. So, you know, it's a, it's something that uh, people are starting to look yeah. at. Yeah, some of the universities are researching things where the floor in the bathroom will weigh the person when they walk in yeah. and, and I mean, just all kinds of things. And and they can just go in and hook up a cuff and plug it in and it'll do their blood pressure right. and they can talk to doctors. And so, I mean, that technology is amazing where they're going. Yeah. And it's amazing how quickly the world is evolving and changing mm-hmm. and and being safer, happier, healthier. So that's a, that's a neat thing to share. I saw that and I saw you had a diagram in your book and uh, I was showing that to our producer earlier and she was, she was getting a kick out of it as well. Um, I want to ask one last question and this is a general question in nature. I, I didn't throw this over to you prior to the interview. So uh, I'm going to have you uh, think on your feet here. Uh, what does retirement mean to you? Oh, well, uh, for me personally, uh, retirement, uh, I love my business. I love what I do. So I always have to think about when will I let it go. But retirement for me is security. I want to make sure that I have the right amount of uh, insurance in place. I have uh, long-term care in place to take care of me in the event that he's not around anymore. I don't want my son to have to worry about me. And I want to be able to spend that quality time with my two- and seven-year-old grandchild while I'm still important to them. Uh, So I work towards that, Uh, being able to still be involved, to volunteer, uh, and do things while I still have my health and my mind. John? Personally, a lot of what Ingrid said, yeah, is important to me. Yeah, all of it's important to me. I, John I wants to play golf for it, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and actually, we're building a business that can be a legacy and continue. Our, our son started working with us in the last year, and and so we're building it to where we can, in the next few years, step mm-hmm. out and work part-time in it and, you know, supervise it, maybe go around and speak and teach other people about what we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned earlier we're looking at a retirement uh, home uh, or vacation home, I mm-hmm. should say, in New Mexico. We were talking about moving to New Mexico until grandchildren came along. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, they're now a very important part of our lives. So that's that's kind of it is setting it up so we we built a business that can be a legacy for our, our family and that we can still be involved in as much as we want to and then have a home we can go to and a vacation and live in another place for a while, every once in a while, and spend more time with the family and possibly go around and keep going. Well, you both... You both use that four-letter word, time, and that's what I find is a common thread. You know, it, it, no matter what it is, they say, well, you talked about vacationing, John. You talked about spending time with the grandkids. You know, it's, whether it's grandkids, vacation, or golf, whatever it is, it's all about time. And then you mentioned having that financial security that you didn't have to worry about money anymore. You didn't have to worry about what's next. You could really spend that time focused on what's important. So, hey, thank you two for joining us. But before you go, I, I want to make sure everybody knows what you two did for our audience. Uh, You have sent over a box of your guide, the ultimate guide uh, to downsizing, how to downsize your life, to upsize your lifestyle. And this is a great, uh, I I mean, I 
honestly, I, I saw it and I, you know, well, I wonder if this is going to be any good. And it was really good. And I found a lot of value in this. I think anybody that's thinking about this, going through this process, uh, even if it's parents that you're uh, not sure how to approach the conversation or you're helping them, assisting them with that, uh, there's not just great useful insight in here, uh, but I think that the exercises to me would be the most beneficial uh, part of what is in this book. Uh, and the, the questions, the budgets, uh, just a really helpful book. And, and you two have provided us a box of these to give out to our fans. And we want to do that for all of you. So as many, we're going to continue to give them away until we run out. And they also autograph these. So you can buy these online, but you're not going to get an autographed one like the one that we have here at Howard Bailey. If you would like to get a copy, all you have to do is write a review for the podcast, an honest review for the podcast. You can do that at retirewithpurpose.com. Click on the podcast tab right there at the top. It says leave a review. Or if you're on your iTunes device, you're on your Apple device, you can just scroll down to the bottom, leave a review right there at the bottom. Send us an email at info at howardbailey.com, info at howardbailey.com with your iTunes username, and then we will be sure to get this guidebook out to you as soon as possible at no cost. John, Ingrid, thank you so much for being so gracious, joining us here and and providing us uh, with all these copies and spending all that time getting hand cramps signing them for us we really appreciate it <laughs> okay you're Thank welcome you, we enjoyed it awesome